So welcome to another episode of the Oh Hell No podcast. Tonight I have David Burns, Dr. David Burns. He is a clinical psychiatrist, an adjunct professor at Stanford University School of Medicine, and he is an author and a podcaster. You're just as busy as me, David. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's good to keep busy, but sometimes it gets a little bit overwhelming. I know. Yes, I was feeling that way today. I was feeling so overwhelmed, but I'm pulling it off. I'm making it happen. So. Well, I'm honored to be on your show. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, thanks for coming on. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about you, and then we're going to talk about your book, and then we're going to talk about other people. <laughs> Great. Cool. So what trait did you have as a child that serves you well in your profession today? Boy, I don't know. I'd have to, to think about that. I, <laughs> I think I was curious and, and loved, loved learning and uh, had a lot of, always had a lot of creative ideas, but when I was a kid, people didn't pay attention, didn't listen to me. Now, now that I'm an elderly guy, people pay attention to me probably more than they should. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, it's, uh, I, I, I don't know, my, uh, my dad was a minister and uh, I was born on a Sunday and he named me David Dean Burns because he thought someday I'd be D.D. Burns, D.D., Doctor of Divinity. That's what he was as a minister. He had an honorary Doctor of Divinity degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was little, I thought I would be a minister. Wow. And then in college, I kind of got turned off uh, for sure. And uh, But now I, I find that in my teaching about uh, psychotherapy and how people can recover from depression and anxiety, I'm kind of returning to the idea that although everything I do is based on research and it's secular, it's all based on data, uh, that there is quite a spiritual dimension. So I, I guess I'm, you know, kind of in a, in a weird way father, following in my father's footsteps and, and something that I was intensely interested in as a kid. Yeah, just tapping into it on a different level. Yeah. So um, how old were you when you actually decided to become a psychiatrist? And what made you desire, desire a career in that field? Well, um, a psychiatrist is a medical doctor. And that's the only field I never had any interest in. Mm. And when I was in college at Amherst, I took an interest test to see, you know, what I should uh, go into. And they said, you can, you'd be interested in anything, you know, any profession you'd love. They said, the only thing you should not go into medicine because you won't have anything in common with people in medicine. I said, well, that's, that's great because I, I would never have any interest in going into medicine. And I wasn't a pre-med student or anything like that. I, I was a philosophy major at Amherst College. And I was going to go on to graduate school in philosophy because there were certain puzzles of philosophy that I couldn't figure out, like the free will problem and different puzzles that kind of boggled my brain. And then my, my senior year, I read a book <clears throat> that one of my roommates suggested by Ludwig Wittgenstein called Philosophical Investigations. And uh, Phil said that there were presumably only seven people in the world that could understand it. But he said, if I could understand it and write my dissertation on it, then they, when, I have, when you have to defend your work to the faculty committee, he said, they won't be able to challenge you because they probably don't understand the book. So I read this book and I couldn't understand it. <laughs> and, and then my scene, then in the spring, it, it suddenly dawned on me. I was walking across the Amherst, Amherst campus, and, and I, I, I suddenly understood what he was trying to say in this book. And in a flash, I understood the solutions to all the problems of philosophy. And so I, I had no interest in, in, in going on with it. Wittgenstein wanted his students to give up philosophy, to see it was a kind of illness. So I went to my supervisor and said, I think I'll become a clinical psychologist instead of a philosopher because that's more practical and I can help people. And he says, oh, no, no, you've got to go to medical school. I said, I wouldn't, why would I go to medical school? I'm not even a pre-medical student. I have no interest in medicine. And he says, well, then you can become a psychiatrist instead of a psychologist and a psychiatrist can prescribe drugs. And that's gonna be the big thing in the future. 
And I said, but how could I get into medical school? I haven't had any of the pre-medical classes. He says, oh, you can talk your way into anything. They won't even notice. And so I applied to medical schools and I got into Stanford Medical School. And I think I was one of the worst students they ever had. I couldn't stand it. I cut half of my classes. I dropped out for a full year on two occasions and ended up as a homeless person in, uh, down near uh, Carmel Valley, California. And my wife, while we were living together, she was pregnant. We were about to have a baby. We, we would just sleep on people's floors at night. And I thought, you know, if I just did my internship, and I became a psychiatrist, I still wouldn't know what I was talking about, but people would think I know something and they'd pay me to talk to me and then we could have a place to live, we could buy food. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I decided to go ahead and I did my internship and my residency and then I started winning awards for my, for my research. And, uh, and then I wrote Feeling Good uh, which was about the then new cognitive therapy that I was extremely excited about. And then it uh, has since then sold 5 million copies and it kind of transformed my, my career. And now I have a new, a newer book that's just gonna be out in next week called Feeling Great and has uh, powerful new techniques that I've been developing for the treatment of depression and anxiety in the last 10 years or, or so in my work at Stanford. Wow. So that road that you took to get to where you are today, what do you tell your kids about college? About college? Yeah, or just like going to like school, because you said you weren't a great student, you struggled with that, and then finally Medical you got school. it to get, right. Yeah. So what would you, what would your advice be to them about going to college or like, you know, finding their career path? Well, you know, what, what I've found is that it's, you know, first of all, I think education is tremendously important and it's also important to do your own thing, to do something you believe in. When I was at Penn, I, I won one of the world's top awards in research on, on neurochemistry, on, on how the brain works. Mm -hmm. And I had a tenure track position, but I didn't want to stay as a full-time academic because I knew this theory of a chemical imbalance causing depression was not true. Our, our research showed clearly it was just, there was no good evidence for it. And our research kind of showed that it couldn't be true. And then I heard about a new drug-free approach to treating depression and decided to give up a full-time academic career to go into private practice and stay on the volunteer faculty so I could help develop this new cognitive therapy, which at the time was considered quackery. Mm -hmm. There were only about 12 of us doing it in the world when I wrote Feeling Good when it was published in 1980. But since that book came out, Feeling Good has become the most popular form of psychotherapy in the world and the most researched form in history. And what I've found for myself personally is to pursue your dream. It, it, it's, it's good to do the formal thing. Uh, you know, I, I followed the rules. I became a top psychiatrist at a top me medical center, uh, but I wasn't happy. And, and I knew that what I was doing wasn't, wasn't gonna add up. And I, I wanted to cure people. I wanted to heal people quickly who were depressed and anxious. And I knew all, giving them all the pills in the world wasn't, wasn't doing it for, for most of them, for hardly any of them. And then I found something I believed in. I poured my heart into it. I, I've, I've, I've had a ball. My, you know, my, yeah. my dream has kind of come, come true and I'm, I'm, I'm a happy guy. So I think you've got to both, you know, try to get the best academic credentials you can get. I, I did that. Uh, but then you, you I, for me, it was helpful to have a sense of integrity uh, and, and, to do, and to do the thing I believed in. Okay. Uh, All right. So I was going to ask you a little bit about your struggles in school and stuff like that, but you kind of summed that up with, um, you know, what you shared. So I'm going to go right into your theory about um, your thoughts being connected to how you feel. And like you just um, touched on um, saying that the chemical imbalance theory is not really valid. And, 
you know, you have this theory that, you know, if you feel good or if you think you feel good or. <laughs> it's not quite it. You're close. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Don't let me tell you. I know what it is. <laughs> when you change the way you think, um, you can change the way you feel. Yeah, okay. ab absolutely. Uh, that, that, that's it. it. It goes. It's, it's a simple theory. There's two theories we're working now now to get the super fast re recovery. But when I wrote Feeling Good in 1980, that was all about cognitive therapy, which at the time was a revolution. Uh, and it based on the simple idea that your thoughts create all of your moods. It's not what happens to you, but the thoughts you, you have about them. And this is such a simple idea that people can't understand it uh, at first. But right now, there are people listening to the show and they have different thoughts about what they're hearing. They may think, oh boy, that Burns, he sounds like a total quack or, or a con artist or, or you know, or he, he says he can cure people of depression in a single two hour session, that, that's impossible. And so if they're thinking that, then they, they're, they're feeling uh, kind of angry and annoyed and suspicious. That, that, that would be an example. Or someone may be listening to this and saying, oh wow, there's a new drug-free treatment for depression and people can recover quickly uh, without having to take drugs. Maybe just by reading a book, I could recover from years of depression. This is awesome. This sounds great. Well, if they're thinking that, they're gonna be happy and excited. And, and so all the, all the time, it's what you're thinking, the messages you, you give yourself. And then a second important part, and this is pretty incredible, is that when you're feeling depressed or anxious, the thoughts that cause those horribly painful feelings, thoughts like, I'm a loser, I'm hopeless. When I give my talk, I'm, my mind will go blank. I'm gonna screw up. People are gonna judge me. People are gonna look down on me. Those are the kind of thoughts that, that cause depression and anxiety and they're distorted they're illogical. D depression and anxiety are the world's oldest cons because you're telling yourself something that, that simply isn't, isn't true. And the last part of it is when you crush those distorted thoughts in that very instant, <clears throat> you can change the way you feel. To give you a quick, quick example, I did a live demonstration and this is one of the cases that people can read about when they uh, read Feeling Great. It was a, a, a woman who had struggled for nine years with horrific depression and anxiety and guilt and shame. And what had happened is her 12 year old daughter had gotten shot in the face by neighborhood boys who snuck up on her and shot her in the mouth with a high powered pellet rifle. And it, it exploded on one of her teeth and caused a great deal of damage to her mouth. She, she ran indoors screaming blood was gushing from her mouth and this led to nine years of, of surgeries and treatment for, for Karen's daughter for post-traumatic stress disorder and all those treatments weren't, weren't working and for those nine years Karen had been telling herself this is my fault that she got thought, shot. I, I'm a failure as a, as a mother. Uh, I, I never should have let her go out, go out to play. And, and, and those thoughts have all, all kinds of, of distortions that she, that she was unaware of, like telling herself, I never should have let her go out to play. Well, she'd let her go out to play every night for years and it worked fine. But it's, she's telling herself like fortune telling, I should have been able to predict the future and told her, oh, sweetheart, don't go out right now. You're about to get shot. Wait 10 minutes and then you'll be okay. And then telling herself, I'm a failure as a mother that, in, that involves self-blame self and discounting the positive. You, you will never find a more loving and devoted mother than, than Karen. And she was also thinking, I treated her in front of a live audience in San Francisco and she was telling herself, these people in the audience, they're probably judging me too and thinking I'm a failure as a mother. And that's called mind reading, assuming that others are, are looking down on you without any, any real evidence. And in the session, we uh, did some exercises that, that made her suddenly aware of how distorted and unfair these thoughts were. And at the very moment that she stopped believing those thoughts, her depression disappeared. In fact, she went from extremely severe depression and anxiety really into a state of euphoria by the end of, of, of the session. And then she's done well for three or four years since that happened. But that illustrates the idea that 
you see, it was what happened to her daughter was horrible, mm -hmm. but that was not the cause of her shame, her anxiety, her guilt, her, her depression, her hopelessness. It was what she was telling herself. And that's right. potentially liberating because the world is filled with a lot of crap, a lot of mean spiritedness. Uh, there's a, a lot of bias, there's racial bias, there's hatred, there's people looking down on, on others. We, we all hit, hit bumps in the road of life and, and bad things happen, but it's very liberating to, to know that you can change the way you feel. You can't always change what's happening in the world. Sometimes you can, but usually there's not a great deal you can do, but you can change the way you think and change the way you feel. And it's, it's a powerful message. And the only difference is that in the last uh, 10, 15 years at Stanford, we've developed even more powerful techniques that have to do with reducing resistance, uh, resistance to change. Because most people who are like listening right now to the show who are struggling with depression and anxiety, on the one hand, want to kind of feel better, but on the other hand, kind of cling to those negative feelings. Mm -hmm. and, and we've discovered how to get people to stop doing that. To, to let go of that getting sucked in by depression and anxiety. And it takes about 20 minutes to get a person unstuck in that way. And when we do that, and people can read about it and do it for yourself in, in the book, Feeling Great, it opens the door for ultra rapid recovery. And so I'm now seeing people recover at speeds that 20 years ago I would have thought were impossible. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds like an easy concept, right? But you hit it right on the head when you said that um, people, it's hard for people to let go of like negative thoughts and things like yeah. this, you know, and just right. embrace this. Hey, if you tell yourself that you're feeling good, you will start to feel good, you know? That's so. not true, actually. That, that, that would be great to believe that. But if it, depressed people cannot tell themselves to, to feel good. And if you tell a depressed person something like that, they'll get angry and, and hurt because you're right. not showing empathy and compassion. But what it has to do with is smashing the distorted thoughts that cause the depression. You, do, do you see, for example, yes. let me just show you what this means. Karen had the thought, the people are judging me. They think I'm a bad mother. She believed that 100%. Mm -hmm. And then I said, well, now, is there an experiment we could do to test that belief? How, 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 how could we find out? And she said, well, I suppose I could ask them. And I said, would you like to do that? She said, oh, no, that's terrifying. Well, that means it's a good idea because to confront the monster you're afraid of. And then she said, well, if I ask them, they won't tell me the truth. And I said, you don't know that. You, first, you can ask them if they're judging you, and then you can ask them if they're lying through their teeth. But let's see if what you're telling yourself is true or a con. And so she said, okay, would some of you want to come up? Because we, we, we had a video going and, and take a microphone. And then you can tell me what you think of me. Well, pe about 10 people rushed up and got in line and one by one, because they'd been watching her at this point for, for an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. and, and she said, are you judging me? And, and each of them burst into tears and said, Karen, I love you. You're my hero. To get up on stage and talk about something so personal, to share it with all of us, it, it, it's, it's, it's mind, mind blowing. And every person said the same thing. And as they were saying that, Karen just burst into sobbing and suddenly saw that that thought was absolutely not, not true. And the moment you stop believing a negative thought, your feelings will instantly change. So you can't get to the, I think I feel good, so I am feeling good until you um, understand the thought of why you think you don't feel good or like in yeah. her case yeah the, why the thought, she thought yeah. that someone was sure sure if, her. sure if you think people Got are it. judging you you're going to feel terrible and you can tell yourself to cheer up and it's definitely not going to work right but once you find out that what you're telling yourself is a lot of baloney right okay it, then you, then that's the aha moment and you're thrust not only into recovery but often into a state of what the mystics have called enlightenment see when when i was trained as a psychiatrist and you know when i teach at stanford uh, in the in the in the medical school, uh, the, the pe people are being taught that depression comes comes on 
f over years and it takes years to, 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 to recover. And that, that kind of idea is in our culture and you have to talk to some shrink who nods and says, tell me more for, for years. And, and then, you, then maybe eventually, if ever, you, you, you'll start feeling better. And, and this is, idea is that, no, it doesn't work like that. that at any moment that you're depressed, you're telling yourself things that aren't true, that are making you miserable. And the whole uh, strategy that we, we use is various techniques to reveal to the person that those thoughts that you're beating up on yourself, you're being a bully to yourself, those thoughts are fraudulent, they're, they're not true. And the moment you see they're, they're not true, in that instant, you'll, you'll, you'll change. And the goal is not improvement in depression and, dep and anxiety, but a complete obliteration of it. And, and, and going even further to experience a, a, a state of joy. So what about people who um, suffer from like depression where they say, if the weather is a certain way that, you know, triggers my depressed mood or, you know, well, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example of that because uh, the weather can never have any effect on your mood. Only your thoughts can, can affect your mood. But some people believe that type of thing. And, and there's this type of thing that some people think their moods get bad, you know, in the winter. Uh, right. because of the sun, there's not enough su sunlight. And so I treated a high school girl who uh, said that, uh, you know, uh, every time when she goes back to, to high school in the fall, she, she goes into a state of depression and she thinks it's due to the sunlight. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, d what are your thoughts in, 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 in school? You know, what are the thoughts that are making you unhappy? And she said, oh, well, I'm one of the unpopular kids. And, uh, and she thought that it was something you were born with. And in the area where we lived, there were quite a few wealthy people. That, that wasn't us. We were kind of like the poor people in the neighborhood. But she thought that all these wealthy kids, you know, knew each other and, and popularity was some, some inherent thing. And she was kind of a hopeless, worthless person. And I said, no, uh, popularity is, is actually something you can learn. And, and if you like, you know, I can teach you how to be popular. I can teach you how to make boys chase you, for example. Would you like that? And, and she said she, she would like that. <laughs> so I taught her how to flirt and how to twist boys around her fingers, you know, like to, to control the boys. Right. And she was good at it. And within weeks, she was uh, having like 35 calls a night of boys asking her for dates. And suddenly she didn't have this weather related depression anymore. She, right. she, she went into a state of euphoria and, uh, and, and it's, you know, like it's dealing with the things that are bothering you in, in, in a skillful yeah. way. And I, and, and I know because that was my daughter. Oh, wow. Okay. And when we even joke about it today, I said, you remember those days? She said, oh, yeah, dad, it was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. So let's move on because I know that you have a hard stop. So yeah. um, now with COVID, yeah. it seems like a lot of people are struggling and a lot of people mm -hmm. are going through, you know, depression. Yeah. Um, so a situation like this, again, is it just people telling themselves being, you know, creating this hysteria because, oh my God, I, I don't want to catch this. I'm, I'm, if I catch this, I'm going to die. Or, you know, I lost my job. I don't have, you know, just creating this anxiety because they're having all of these negative thoughts and just telling themselves. Yeah, yeah. right. That's, that's right. But the thing is that those negative thoughts and people are depressed and anxious are always distorted. And on my website, feelinggood.com, I have tons of free resources for people, including my Feeling Good podcasts. Mm -hmm. And and I have a special section of called Corona Casts, where I treat people live with Corona-related re uh, depression and anxiety, and all of them recovered in a single session. And you can hear the therapy going on live and see how it works. But it, but in all the cases, they were telling themselves something that that wasn't true. And the moment they they we exploded that myth, uh, their their depression went away. Like one woman uh, I worked with was married to an emergency room doctor, and she has three little children. She's a psychologist, mm -hmm. and and so he has moved eight blocks away be, because he works with Corona all the time in the intensive care unit and the emergency room. And he had to intubate two of his colleagues, intubation meaning they're about to die, 
mm -hmm. the people he worked with who were di about to die of COVID. And she cries herself to sleep every night, uh, t telling, telling herself all kinds of negative thoughts about the situation. And one of the thoughts that bothered her the most was, I can't let Greg, my husband, know how, how upset I, I am. I, I, have to hide, I have to hide my feelings. I have to be strong. And she talked about crying herself to sleep every night, being afraid he's going he's gonna to get COVID and, and die, and, and she'll lose her, her husband. And she said it was like having a husband in the Civil War mm. and not knowing what day he's going to get shot on. Right. Well, the, what she was telling herself, I have to be strong. I shouldn't be upset. I shouldn't share my, my feelings with my husband. When she thought about it, th that's like uh, all kinds of distortions. Mind reading, she's assuming her husband doesn't want to know how she's feeling. It's, it's a should statement. She's telling herself she shouldn't be upset. She should be strong all, all the time, which is kind of nonsensical. And as soon as she saw that during the session, so suddenly her, her, her depression w went, went away. But, but she still had this intense fear that, uh, boy, what, what, what if he gets COVID? And then the odd thing was that uh, three or four days after the session, her husband got COVID. Ooh. And what do you think happened to her mood? It went back down. No, she went into a state of euphoria. What? Well, yeah, when you confront your worst fear, you usually discover the monster has no teeth. He, he, he contracted a mild case of it. Okay. And was able to keep working and survived. <laughs> And then was able to come back home, and then they decided to to rent a house for a, a weekend and have a, give themselves a little time together. And we had a follow up Corona cast with her, and she was just in a state of of, of ecstasy. Well, that's a great story. That's a great ending, you know. So I could see how she'd be happy, but I'm glad that it worked out that way. But um, even when something terrible happens, it's still your thoughts. Like another one of the podcasts was with a colleague named Marilyn, mm -hmm. who asked for an emergency session and allowed me to 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 record it and then publish it. And and her uh, event was not one that she could deny. She went to the doctor for a routine medical checkup, and he said, "You have stage four lung cancer, Ooh. terminal lung cancer," and she was freaking out. Right. Uh, and, and, and yet in a single session, her thoughts were all distorted that were causing her depression. It wasn't the lung cancer. Right. But what she was telling her, herself, beating up on herself, telling herself, I'm not spiritual enough. I should, I'm losing my belief in the afterlife. This means I'm not a, a, a good Christian. Uh, you, you know, I've, I've failed in my life because I had a drinking problem. I'm a failure because I never found a life partner. All kinds of mean spirited things. And, and once she learned how to stop doing that to herself during the session, her, her depression and anxiety disappeared. It's a very empowering message uh, that, that I've shared in my first book, Feeling Good, and then the new book, Feeling Great. And that's you can change the way you, you feel when you change the way you think. And yeah. uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a life changing message. So do you think a lot of um, people, because I feel like a lot of young people are always saying that they have anxiety, they have yep. depression. Yep. It's so overwhelming. Like when I was growing up, I don't remember hearing so many people with this and people killing themselves so often. Do you think there's a lot of misdiagnosis going on and people just being in this state of, you know, beating up on themselves and feeling bad and down and just... Yep. You yeah, know. and I and I think and we put on a false front so others can't tell. Yeah, people are good at doing that. I had a, did a workshop recently for uh, mental health professionals, but twenty percent were general citizens. Mm -hmm. you, I, it was I was supposed to be. It was like there were three hundred and fifty people who came, and uh, the general citizen just snuck in. I guess I, w I was happy to have them, but we asked the question at the beginning of the workshop: How many of you? beat up on yourselves and make yourselves unhappy much of the time with self-critical thoughts. And 98% of the people said yes. And these were presumably experts. Only 2% of the people said they're happy most of the time. Yeah. So I, but, but yet if you were to meet these people like Karen, who I told you about, mm 
mm-hmm. who, who thought she was a failure as a mother and been in misery for nine, nine years. If you'd met her, she is charming. She's intelligent. She's, she's funny. You would have no idea that she was dying inside. Uh, But I I think there is a tremendous uh, amount of depression and anxiety in our culture. And I've done surveys of people, how they felt before the corona hit and since the corona hit. And negative feelings in women have doubled. Depression, anxiety, hopelessness, and anger have actually doubled in women. In men, uh, anger has doubled. Yes. Wow, that's interesting. So your new book is called Feeling Great, The Revolutionary New Treatment for Depression and Anxiety. If you, if you could um, ensure that people got one message from this book, what is the one message that you want them to? You can change the way you feel. It's not a hopeless situation. There are powerful new drug-free techniques to, to go from depression or anxiety, not only to get rid of them, but to go to a state of joy. You know, feeling good feels wonderful. You owe it to yourself to feel good or to feel great. And the, uh, the research on my first book, Feeling Good, indicated that 65% of the people, if you just hand them a copy of this book, people with severe depression, they'll be recovered or dramatically improved in four weeks with no treatment, no psychotherapy, no, no medications. And I believe the new book, Feeling Great, will be even more powerful than, than the first book because the new techniques are even more powerful than what I had in 1980. So for people who are extreme, like um, people who have like psychotic breakdowns and stuff like that, do you think that those people need medication before they could actually read a book and get to a better place? Well, they might be able to read the book and get to a better p- place, but the, the schizophrenia isn't going to be cured with, with these techniques, sadly. And they often will need medications when they're in a psychotic episode and hallucinating or when someone has bipolar one and they're in a manic episode and they're, they're you know, de- delusional. Uh, but uh, the, what, what I found in my career, you know, I started out prescribing drugs. I worked in a county hospital, Highland Hospital in Oakland, and we had hundreds hundreds of people with schizophrenia come into our emergency room every week mm-hmm. and, and use, use powerful medications, which, which they, they had to have. I mean, some of them were swinging swords through the air and hallucinating and, right. you know, aggressive and and, and very confused. But once I, I learned the uh, psychotherapy techniques, uh, that plus medication when needed is far more effective for people with schizophrenia uh, th- than just than just drugs alone or people with bipolar illness. But sometimes drugs can, can be life-saving. So I've never been against drugs, but I just think it's good news that the vast majority of people with depression and anxiety can now not only improve, but recover completely if they want, you know, w- without me- medications. Okay, good. I just wanted to bring that point up. So I want you to shed some light on your career. If you want to become a psychiatrist, this is for like people who might be interested in this field, young people who, or even someone who's a little bit older, who, who, who is thinking of a career change. If you want to become a psychiatrist, you need to be able to Decide not to do it. That would be my recommendation. <laughs> I don't think it's a good idea. I shouldn't oh, have done it. I should on, have David. gone to psychology graduate school. And the <laughs> clinical psychologists are really smart. The, the smart ones get PhDs and the rest go to medical school. Right. But the uh, the I think clinical psychology is a great area that, uh, or, or uh, learn to ca- counseling or get a, a clinical social work uh, degree. I have a free training uh, class at Stanford for community therapists every Tuesday. They can get unlimited free psychotherapy training every Tuesday night. That, that's what I have to do in a, in a few minutes here is, is my class is going to start up. But, nice. but, I, but I, if you want to help people and work with people, I, I don't personally uh, think that the uh, psychiatry is, uh, if you want to learn psychotherapy, you know, it, that, that's not the thing. You're, you're going to just learn pills, pills, pills. 
And, and if they had been what they were cracked up to be, I, I would have stuck with my career in psychopharmacology and brain research. We had one of the top drug prescribing teams in the world when I was at University of Pennsylvania. But I could see clearly that, you know, the vast majority of my depressed patients weren't being cured by, by pills and, and I wanted something that, that, that would work. So I, we told our kids, don't go to medical school. Uh, right. You know, if you want to do therapy, there are more direct ways of, you know, investing your, your time and, and efforts. Great. I love that advice. Finish this sentence, David. It's never too late to... Change the way you think and feel. It's never too late to experience enlightenment, to experience uh, joy, to, to experience intimacy, to, to learn how, how, how to connect with people. I, I learn things every day. The older I get, life becomes more of an adventure. Yeah, I agree. I love what I do because... Well, they, because I can now, 90% uh, of the people I treat recovery in one two-hour session. I treat everyone for free uh, and have for the last 25 years because it's so much fun. And, and when the other person becomes euphoric, I become euphoric. It's a Buddhist idea that we're one. And there's no greater gift than being able to heal somebody in, in a single session who's been struggling for years or, or decades. That, that, that's one of the funnest things I do, talking to you. That, that's another fun, f fabulous thing, sharing information, the teaching I'm about to do with my Tuesday group, the, the podcast. I'm developing a new Feeling Great app that I, that, mm -hmm. with some fantastic young colleagues. And I think that too will be able to heal people quickly without having to go to a therapist. Uh, all the things I'm doing are just exciting beyond belief that there's just too, too much excitement. <laughs> right. So I, uh, I always ask, do you feel like you're doing your purpose work? And if so, what part of it feeds your soul? And I think you've just said, yeah, what yeah. It is. yeah, to follow to follow your dream, I, I could have been a very prominent uh, psychiatrist. And by following the the, the official road, Mm -hmm. But I just thank God that that that, that I didn't, and and the, you know that I I followed my own my own road, and it just paid off, on, on, unimaginably. I've made so many mistakes in my life, but a lot of things have really, really worked out, and I'm I just I'm I'm grateful beyond belief. I love that you said that, David. Follow your own road, people. So. Um... On the Oh Hell No podcast, I always ask my guests to share an Oh Hell No moment that has taught them something or um, changed their perspective on something in life. So an Oh Hell No moment is a moment of shock, disbelief. It could be a positive moment, a negative moment, but it's just, a, we have a lot of these moments, by the way, right? Yeah. So share one that you- Well, a big one for me was when I started my research at University of Pennsylvania that we were testing this theory that you could get grants from NIMH that it was depression was due to a serotonin deficiency in the brain, you know, chemical imbalance. And so we had a, a, a research unit with depressed veterans mm -hmm. and we flooded their brains with like a hundred times the normal level of serotonin. Mm -hmm. And you know what happened to their moods? What? Nothing. <laughs> And it was like, oh, hell, 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 this is a crappy theory. Get out of the field, David. That was my oh, hell, hell moment, and it was a good one. That was your oh, hell, no moment, right? Oh, hell, no, yeah, right. right. This, this theory sucks. And then my supervisor said, well, David, we've got a good thing going. You're already world known. Yeah, we can get millions of dollars in grants. We'll get drug companies. will give us tons of money to test these serotonin drugs. He says, he says don't, don't make a, a, a stink. And I said, listen, I, I want to do something that's meaningful with my life. Mm. Good for you, David. Thank you so much for coming on my show. I really enjoyed talking to you. Please tell everyone where they can pick up your book and how we can connect with you, where your podcast is, all that good stuff. Well, Quickie, you can get uh, Feeling Great or any of my books, Feeling Good or Feeling Great on Amazon is the easiest way. My website is easier to remember. It's www.feelinggood.com. 
and you, there's a free depression class there, a free anxiety class. There's over 200 free podcasts on how to change the way you, th you think and feel. I, I think th those would th be the two resources. And then if you want to be a beta tester on our new Feeling Great app, go to feelinggood.com forward slash app, and you can sign up to be a beta tester. So nice. that, that would be it. And thank you so much. I've got to run because I've got less yes. than one minute to make it to my Stanford class. All right, David. Thanks again for coming. Thanks on. a lot. It was bye. just awesome. I really <laughs> love the interview. No problem. Talk to you again. Yeah. Yes. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.